Hi guys, this is Ms. Raina coming to you from C347 at MacArthur High School. I just want to give you a little bit of a warning. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. So um, keep in mind, you're probably going to need to pause the video every once in a while where you need to write something down. So this is the first thing I want you to write down here, that the, the ocean is important physically as well as it is biologically because of the high heat capacity of water, it can store a lot of heat, and because of the currents of the ocean water, it can move a lot of heat energy um, from really, really big distances from one part of the world to the other. It's also a giant store for carbon dioxide um, and a few other greenhouse gases, things like methane. Um, it's also a giant store for oxygen. So all that churning at the top surface of the water, just like I told you for freshwater ecology, um, that's the that's kind of like the barrier where all of that gas transfer takes place. And if the oxygen can get in and be dissolved, so can carbon dioxide. So let's look at um, a couple of zones of the marine environment. We're going to look at the intertidal or the beach zone first, so the shallower places. This is, um, this is one of those terms that might have been a little difficult to find in your vocabulary, so I want you to write it down if you haven't got it. We're going to look at the shallower water closer to the beach. So the part before the breaker bar, the breaker bar is what forces the water up to start the formation of the waves that you see at the beach. Before that, where you don't see waves forming, that's what we're going to call the lower shore face. The upper shore face is, it starts right there where the waves begin to form. The four beaches, um, it contains what we call the swash zone. So as you're walking along the beach and the, the water is kind of like swashing back and forth, that's what we call four beach. Back beach is the part that's only covered during a high tide. So during a low tide, this is flat sand. During high tide, it's all covered up. The four island dunes is the area that is not covered during high tide. Typically only floods during a big storm, hurricane, something like that. But these dunes, these are like little hills, and they're not constant. Um, they're not stationary. They move around because of the wind. All right, so if you are an organism that lives on the beach in one of these zones, then you have to be adapted for certain difficulties. So there are these areas that sometimes are covered with water and sometimes not. So you have to be able to adapt to that. Either you burrow or you move along with the tide. Um, what if you're not on a sandy beach and you're on a rocky beach, then you have to defend yourself against constantly being bashed against the rocks. So a lot of organisms will form almost like an epoxy, a really, really, really strong glue. People are still trying to, to emulate this kind of glue that, for example, barnacles make because they can be bashed with wave after wave after wave of water their whole life and they will never be knocked loose from the rocks, and so that's their defense. They hold still onto the side of the rocks. All right, um, here's another type of zone. It's an estuary, and we looked at this a little bit in the wetland section, but we're gonna look at it in a little more detail. So the estuary is where the river meets the ocean. Here comes all of this kind of like warm-ish, very nutrient-rich water, slow moving, coming down from a river. Meanwhile, the ocean tide is going up and down, up and down, so you've got this constantly changing mix of salt water and fresh water, very high in nutrition about right here. The salinity changes every time the tide goes up and down. Um, it changes depending on the precipitation that's going down the river here. Um, and so the organisms that live in an estuary have to be ready for that. Um, there's lots and lots of nutrition there, and so it's a really, really, really good place for biodiversity and for productivity. Um, why is it so fertile? Because there's so much nutrition that's being transported, transported from the watershed, from the river's watershed. Also, the tides will help circulate the nutrients, and so we're not depending on something like the fall and the spring turnover. There's shallow water, and so there's lots of light. There's lots of plants because of that shallow water. They can reach the sun and they can reach the, their roots can reach the benthic surface at the same time. So we have lots and lots of producers to, to, pro, to uh, support this environment. Moving on to the open ocean. So now we've covered the intertidal zone, we've covered an estuary, and you can make kind of like a new title on your notes about the open ocean. We're going to look at several different zones.
So the pelagic zone is out there away from the beach, the open water. Um, all right, so the euphotic zone is the top of that open water. It's open to lots of light. The phytoplankton live up here. No actual plants like you're used to can live up here because they can't reach the bottom surface and put down their roots. It has to be the floating, really, really small plants, phytoplankton. So they're big supporters of this marine environment. They can do their photosynthesis. Um, and they can provide the, the basis of this whole ecosystem here. The bathyal zone, it doesn't get nearly as much light and it doesn't have nearly as much, it doesn't have any contact with the atmosphere up here, so it doesn't have as much dissolved oxygen. The abyssal zone is the other extreme. Very dark, very cold, very little dissolved oxygen because it doesn't have um, the proximity to the surface up here. Benthic, B for benthic, B for bottom, that's the bottom surface. It's not necessarily the deepest water, but that's where a lot of the nutrition kind of like ends up settling down. And so you get those detritivores, bacteria, worms, clams, filter feeders, they burrow down there and they soak up all of that extra nutrition. On that benthic surface, we have a couple of really important uh, environment. So one is seagrass beds and these have to be in the shallower water where the leaves can have enough access to light to do their photosynthesis and the roots um, can reach down to the bottom surface. Um, so it has to be 10 meters or less of depth. It can't be a whole lot of churning in the water. Um, so a lot of times you find them where there's a breaker bar very, very, very far out. Um, and it's got to be pretty pretty warm, so it can't happen in, in polar areas. Um, but those grasses can stop surface erosion. They can provide really nice habitats, support a lot of biodiversity. You end up with some really cool looking organisms. Kelp beds serve a lot of the same purposes. So this is algae. One misconception is that it's a plant. It looks like plant leaves and plant roots, but it's a big community of algae, and they will serve a lot of the same purposes, provide habitat, increase biodiversity. Sometimes you can find these in cooler water and along rocky coasts, so they don't have the same kind of requirements for um, slow-moving, warm water. Coral reefs are um, a symbiotic phenomenon, so it's got to be an algae organism that will photosynthesize combined with a coral polyp, the little coral animal. So the coral animal will build that um, solid structure um, and they'll filter feed at night. They can paralyze small animals, little plankton, um, but the algae will kind of like tempt those animals to come along. So they'll do the photosynthesis and they look like bait for the, anim the little zooplankton and the animals that the coral want to eat. Um, the water has to be clear, cannot be nutrient rich, and the water has to have lots of sunlight for the algae, and it has to have a nice warm temperature. So coral are very, very, very picky. The coral will grow slowly. So if they start to run out of resources or they start to be depleted, it takes a long time for them to come back. Here's a couple of different types of coral reefs, a fringing reef, is just like fringe on your clothing. It's right along the edge. Here are a couple of pictures. An atoll is um, a reef that's around a mountain under the water where the mountain doesn't breach the surface, but the reef does. And so from above, it just looks like a little circle. Um, and the mountain there is underneath, but it's the coral that's made that structure. So sometimes from above, it looks like little bubbles. Um, but what's going on there is there's a mountain underneath and the coral is building around it. A barrier reef uh, is just like in Australia. The reef builds up, not along the coast, but a little further away from the coast. It breaks the waves further out. You have some nice, clear, shallow, calm water close to the beach. It makes for some very, very interesting habitats. Also protects your coastline from erosion because it makes the waves break further out. For us, because of all that biodiversity, sometimes we can even get medicines out of there. We can charge people to go on tours. Um, it's a big tourist attraction, and we can go out and look for seafood. Um, the problem is the coral reefs are at risk big time. Um, 
from direct effects from fishing and some indirect things. Um, maybe we divert water from a river, or maybe we put too much fertilizer in the watershed and we end up smothering the reefs. This is an example of what some people do to go fishing, and they'll blow up a coral reef and destroy a lot of the biodiversity there. Um, the good news is, after all of this destruction, coral reefs are capable of recovering from that damage. Um, it's difficult to get everybody to agree on exactly how to do that and what is worth protecting and what is not, but that's part of the importance of being informed. So thank you for sticking with me through this longish video. Um, please bring any questions you have to class tomorrow.